Today we're in, in Micah. We're going to continue our, our study in chapter 5 by looking at verses 3 through 15. And what I'll do is I'll read to you verse 3, and then I'm going to give you a bit of a reminder of where we've been. Then I'll move on and uh, complete the chapter this evening. So Micah chapter 5, we'll read verse 3 and begin there. Micah 5, 3 reads, Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. Now, when we were last together, we closed by looking at the prophecy related to Messiah that Micah had given to us that is found in verse 2. Remember how he had said, You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so the last time we were together, I mentioned to you that this is one of those prophecies that relate to Messiah. I also mentioned that the Bible is unique in that it contains prophecy. You can look at other so-called religious books you don't find prophecy in those, in those books. But you do find prophecy in your Bibles. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. So this is speaking to us concerning God's omniscience. He knows all things. And thus, because he is omniscient, because he knows all things, he would communicate to those who are referred to as prophets things that were to take place. In Isaiah 46, in verses 9 and 10, it reads, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God. There is no other. I am God. There's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. So God declares that he gives to us knowledge of future events, and thus we know the scriptures are filled with prophecies. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 contained one of those, a prophecy related to Messiah. Now, there are differing numbers that relate to the amount of prophetic verses that refer to Christ in the Old Testament and all that he, that he fulfilled, but a conservative number is over 300. I've seen the number 353 all the way up to over 400 prophecies found in the Old Testament that are referring to Jesus Christ. But you can, you can um, settle to know that there are at least, at least, 300 scriptures in the Old Testament that uh, speak prophetically concerning Christ. Again, Micah chapter 5, verse 2 being one of them. So I've mentioned to you before, and this is one of my favorite things to remind you about, that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling prophecies is astronomical. And I cut and I paste this, and I'm just going to read it to you just to illustrate this in order to um, demonstrate to you how Jesus is fulfilling of prophecies like Micah 5.2 really points to the reality of God being omniscient and Jesus being the fulfillment of those things that God has stated. Professor Emeritus of Science at Westmont College, Peter Stoner, has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning Messiah. The estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing some 600 students. The students weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy, and examined the circumstances which might indicate that men had conspired together to fulfill a particular prophecy. Professor Stoner then took their estimates and made them even more conservative. He also encouraged other scientists, including skeptics, to make their own estimates to see if his conclusions were more than fair. Finally, he submitted his figures for review to a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation. 
Upon examination, they verified that his calculations were dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. Concerning Micah 5, verse 2, where it states the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, Stoner and his students determined the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present. Then they divided it by the average population of the earth during the same period. They concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was one in 300,000. After examining only eight different prophecies, they estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was one uh, in 10 to the 17th power. 10 to the 17th power is a figure with 17 zeros. Stoner said, if you mark one of 10 tickets and place all the tickets in a hat, thoroughly stir them, and then ask a blindfolded man to draw one, his chance of getting the right ticket is one in 10. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power in silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man, tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote them in their own wisdom. It is impossible that one man could have fulfilled eight. Jesus fulfilled over 300, some estimating over 400. And so that's why I was saying to you last, last week, last time we were together, that you can trust the word of God. Because God knows all things. He is omniscient. And thus, when you read these prophecies, you're so used to them because even if a person's not a Christian, they've, they've heard this scripture before. You can ask somebody who doesn't know God, uh, where was the Messiah born? Where was Jesus born? And if they know any of their Christmas songs or seasonal songs, they'll say, well, wasn't he born in old little town of Bethlehem or something like that? Because they know that because that's part of American religious history and all. But the fact is, the idea that he actually was born in Bethlehem is something that we ought to understand in relation to the other prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled. And so when we're reading through Micah and we see this prophecy concerning him, it's something that's supposed to stir our hearts. Now, as Micah is speaking, Micah is now giving to us some insight concerning the years that are following the giving of Messiah. And that's what you see in verse 3. Verse 2 spoke concerning Messiah, but verse 3 speaks of the years that are following. And so in verse 3, it says, He shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So when Jesus was given to the people, their immediate response was rejection. Remember that with me as you've studied through the gospel, as you read through the gospels, you know that Jesus was rejected by, by the people. That was prophesied once again by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 53, verse 3 said, he was, speaking of Messiah, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So Isaiah being written over seven centuries before Christ prophesied that Messiah would be rejected. When you look in the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, John writes, although the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. And so Jesus Christ is rejected. That is what is being spoken of here when it speaks and says, he shall give them up. He gives them up because they rejected them. So in the rejection of Messiah, difficult times are going to come to the nation. Now, specifically, Israel has had very tough times through its history. But this also is speaking concerning the latter days. The latter days will be a time of great pain for the nation of Israel during a time that is called the tribulation. 
And so when he speaks here and it says, uh, until the time that she who is in labor has given birth, that gives us an insight into the pain that the nation goes through. Now, I've got several women in here, and many of you more than likely gave birth, and you probably could very easily say, if I said, you know, giving birth, piece of cake, no problem, no pain, you probably would beat me afterwards for saying that. You want to know what pain is? I'll show you pain. Now, somebody once said that a birth pang is kind of like taking your bottom lip and pulling it over the top of your head. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I understand it as a very painful thing. And that's the picture that's being given to us here. When he speaks of, of labor, when he speaks of travail, it's a picture of a painful time. And so Messiah will be rejected, and the nation of Israel will go through a painful time. It says, until the time that she who's in labor has given birth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So when it says the remnant of the brethren shall return, ultimately, this is again prophetic, ultimately the Jews will be regathered and will come from the ends of the earth. Now, I say this all the time. Some of you get bored and say, oh, can't you say something different? And the answer to that is, yes, I can, but no, I won't, because it's important to remember this. It helps us to keep things in context. In history, in history, I don't know of any record, perhaps we have historians in the room right now who could differ, but I don't know in history an ancient people like the Jews, the Israelites, being dispersed in the manner that Israel was dispersed taken from Israel in AD 70 and all with the onslaught of the Roman Empire and, and the dispersion. You know, the nation of Israel has gone through multiple dispersions. You see them in Scripture. The, the, uh, the Assyrians came and took them. The Babylonians came and took them. The Romans took them. You see this nation that has been taken captive. And yet the miracle of Israel is something that we Americans in this day have seen, we seem to have forgotten. The idea that a people who were scattered throughout the planet would actually regather to a small portion of land in the Middle East and once again have a nation called Israel is unheard of. That's one of the reasons why when you read commentators, those, for those of you who teach Bible studies, and I'm sure I have some in this room, who teach Bible studies, that's one of the reasons why when you are studying some of the commentators from the 1800s and all, they offer to you something called replacement theology. How many of you have ever heard that term? Just, just, okay, replacement theology. They say that the church replaced the nation of Israel in prophecies in God's plan. And why do they say that? They say that because when they were writing, there was no nation of Israel. There, there, there was no recognized nation of Israel. And so all these prophecies like Romans uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and a variety of others, Ma Matthew 24, so many prophecies that are related to Messiah and promises that God gives and all, they would read those and they'd say, but there's nothing there. There is no nation of Israel. This cannot be speaking literally. It has to be speaking figuratively, allegorically. So you see different means in which they would interpret the scriptures because there was no nation of Israel. And yet there were some in the later 1800s especially, but there have been some throughout the history of the church who have said, no, God is going to do a miracle and regather the nation. And so in 1948, when Israel once again was declared to be a nation, that was unheard of. And now you see that God's word was accurate when he made these promises. For example, Jeremiah 30 verse 3. The time is coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people of Israel and Judah. I will bring them home to this land that I gave to their ancestors. They will possess it and live here again. I, the Lord, have spoken. Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your land. Zephaniah 3, 20, at that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. And then Jesus, Luke 21, 24. 
They, speaking of the Jews, will be brutally killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world. Jerusalem will be conquered and trampled down by the Gentiles until the age of the Gentiles come to an end. Jesus spoke concerning it. Jesus and Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, they all spoke concerning the fact that events would take place in the land of Israel and the nation of Israel and that the people would be regathered and God would do a fresh and new work. And so here in verse 3, it says, He shall give them up until the time that she was in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. This would be speaking prophetically and would um, be referring to the time that we refer to in the last days, especially the tribulation. It says in verse 4, And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And so he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. Obviously, that would be a picture of Messiah. That would be speaking of Jesus. Jesus, one of my favorite um, pictures of Christ that you find in Scripture is he's a shepherd. And that's the picture you have here. He shall stand and feed his flock. Jesus is called the good shepherd, and the good shepherd goes before his sheep. He, he, he says, my sheep know me, and I call them by name. He said, I go before them. And so there are stories concerning shepherds in Israel and how that there is a bonding that takes place where, where the shepherd would uh, be there when when a, a, a lamb was born and would take that lamb as it was born. And uh, when the, the, the lamb parted the womb, the shepherd would take the lamb and hold it and speak to it from the very beginning. And that's how the sheep learned the voice of the shepherd. And that's why they would follow his voice. And a stranger, Jesus said, they will not follow because he would bond with those little lambs so they knew his voice and he would call them and he even called them by name. You know, come on, lamb chops, you know, whatever. <laughs> come on, breakfast. But they had a relationship with the shepherd and, you know, and Jesus said, and the shepherd goes before them. And I remember a story of an individual who was there in Israel for the first time and, and they saw this, this, the, these sheep and this man with them, but the, the man was, before, was behind them, not in front of them, and had a stick and was driving them, was driving them. And so the tourist turns to his guide and says, listen, I've been reading the Bible a long time, and the Bible says that the shepherd goes before the sheep and the sheep follow his voice. But as I'm looking here, I see this man here who's behind the sheep, and he's driving them with a stick. And I would like to know, is, has it changed over the last couple thousand years? And the guide laughs and says, oh, no, that's still true. The shepherd still goes before the sheep, and they follow him and follow his voice. But that's not the shepherd. That's the butcher. A long time ago, I was taught by my pastor, you lead the sheep. You don't beat the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. The sheep hear his voice. A stranger's voice, they will not follow. They follow the true shepherd. And so I love the picture of, of the Lord as being our shepherd. Thus, Psalm 23 has special meaning to me when it simply says, the Lord is my shepherd. And God's prophetic words in the nation of Israel when he says, I will be your shepherd. I will seek out my sheep. And he speaks of the false teachers as being those who've enriched themselves off of them, even eating them and taking their wool and making, uh, taking advantage of them and all. Jesus is the good shepherd and Jesus cares for us. In Ezekiel 34 verses 12 through 14, it reads, as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them 
from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations, gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land. I will pastor them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. So God was speaking concerning being their true shepherd. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. And so that's the picture we have here in verse 4 of Messiah. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Messiah is going to be great, and he is going to care for them. In verse 5, and this one shall be peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. That's an interesting, interesting scripture. When it speaks of the Assyrian coming into the land, the term the Assyrian is a picture that speaks of the enemies of Israel. The Assyrian comes into the land is another way of saying when the enemies of Israel come against the nation in those last days. And so we already know as we've been going through this book that there will be nations that will unite against Israel. We're even seeing those configurations of those nations in our day now. And so the Bible specifically names a variety of nations that will come against the nation of Israel. And so God is giving to us a promise. He's giving a promise to the people, really, that when the enemy comes, when the Assyrian comes and treads in palaces, that they're going to have those who are going to be raised up by the Lord who will be their defense. It speaks of his providing protection for the nation through valiant as well as caring leaders. That's what it means when it says, uh, we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. It's speaking of valiant men, noble individuals that will be used at that time to bring protection to, uh, to the nation. In verse 6, they shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. This would be a prophetic picture of the tribulation. Again, at the end of the tribulation, uh, Israel will be strengthened by Messiah, by their shepherd. The confederation of nations will come against Israel. She will be protected and delivered. What's interesting, one of the things that's interesting here is how the land of Nimrod is mentioned. Isn't that, that's an interesting the land of Nimrod. Nimrod. When you look at the Bible in the book of Genesis, there's one who is mentioned by the name Nimrod. And the way he's referred to is Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's the phrase. A mighty hunter before the Lord. And as I was doing a study on that man many years ago now, I remember one of the commentators pointing out something that I'll share with you. And the commentator said, when it says Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, you can get the impression by the word before that that's speaking of him being in front of God, recognized a mighty hunter. He said, but the word before doesn't necessarily mean that it means against. Nimrod was a mighty hunter who was against the Lord. And not only that, when it says Nimrod was a mighty hunter, he wasn't speaking of how he would go out and hunt wild animals. He was a hunter of men. And so Nimrod in the Old Testament is portrayed to us, demonstrated to us, to have been a man in rebellion against God 
and a murderous man. It's a picture of God's enemies. And so when you see here in this scripture, the land of Nimrod at its entrance, it's another picture of the enemies of God, Nimrod being the picture of that. Nimrod is also associated with a very famous tower, the Tower of Babel. And you remember the story of the Tower of Babel. Some of you don't, so let me, let me give it to you. They wanted to build a tower that would reach unto the heavens. One of the problems that we as Americans, especially here in the 21st century, might have is we'll say to ourselves, well, how backwards were these people? You know, were they building a stairway to heaven? You know, inspiring leads, never mind. Um, <laughs> were they building a tower to heaven? Did they really think that they could go out there with brick and mortar and build a tower that reached all the way to the throne room of God? Did they really believe that? You see, what, are we, what we have done is we have taken an evolutionary mindset towards things that happened in the older times. So we look at them as being backwards and stupid, when in fact, biblical uh, teachers will say to us, we are not getting better. If anything, we're not evolving, we're devolving because those who were closer to the beginning had more of the faculties of their own minds. Their brains were, 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 in other words, more of their brain was being used than today. They weren't stupid. And so they aren't stupid. And the Bible doesn't say that they were building some tower. What it says is it was reaching into heaven, and thus there are those who would say what that tower was was not a stairway where they thought that they could climb some stairs and see God. It was a, an astrological tower. It's also referred to as a ziggurat where they would chart the movement of the stars. And instead of worshiping the God of who created all things, they began to worship the things created by that God. And that's what Paul is referring to in the book of Romans when he says that they abandoned God and they worship creatures and the heavens. That's the point he's making. Instead of worshiping God who made all things, who is God blessed above all things, man began to worship the creation rather than the creator, which man still does. Idolatry isn't simply, and we're going to see this in a minute, idolatry isn't simply me going into the woods and cutting down a tree and and making a small image and then plating it with silver or gold and then placing it in front of me and saying, you are my God. It doesn't have to be a statue. It can be anything that takes the place of God. Anything. Anything in my life that takes the place of God. You know, God says in his word, in various places, I am God. And I am a jealous God. He even goes so far as saying, and jealous is my name. The spirit that is within us, James says, longs earnestly or longs jealously. What are you saying? I made you. You belong to me. And I don't want you giving your heart and love to anything else. You say, oh, God is insecure. Some do. I say that to my precious, my wife. I didn't make you, but you're mine. And I don't want you giving your love to anyone else. Is it because I'm insecure? No, it's because I'm in love. And the Lord is in love with us. And he says, you belong to me. I made you. My pastor, Chuck, there's an old story told the story once of the gingerbread man. The man made the gingerbread man. We all know the story. And the gingerbread man came out of the oven and took off running down the, you know, down the lane. And here comes the old man looking for him. He finally finds him because he's been captured. In Chuck's version of the story, he was placed in the window at a bakery. And... Uh, here comes this man who had baked him, and he walks in, 
And he says, I want that gingerbread man. And Baker says, the, the owner of the store says, that's a very unusual, un unusual gingerbread man. He, he walks and he talks. He's going to cost you a lot. He says, well, I want him. And so he pays all that he has to purchase the gingerbread man. And he takes him out and he holds him in his hands and he looks at him and he says, I made you and I bought you. And now I'm going to eat you. No, he didn't say that. I <laughs> he gets some coffee and says, hey, that's good stuff. No, that's not Chuck's version. That's mine. He says, I made you, I bought you, you belong to me. And he was trying to illustrate to, to us how God created us and God paid for us. That's what Paul would be saying, by the way, not gingerbread man, but that's what Paul would be saying when he says, you are bought at a price. You are bought at the price. What price? The precious blood of Jesus. You were created, you ran, he followed, he purchased, he owns. And so we belong to him. He paid for us. And that's why he says, my name is Jealous. It's because you are mine. And rather than giving your love to, to foreign gods, give your love to the one who loves you the most. And so we belong to him. And so his desire is for us to be with him. Now, continuing in verse 7, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep who, if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, none can deliver. Interesting picture. Interesting picture. In the future, when Israel returns to God in obedience, once again, the nation is going to be blessed. The, the, the nation of Israel, as we see it at this moment, is not what God intends for it in the future. You see, when God begins to move amongst them again, when all of the works of the Lord begin to find their fulfillment and God begins to be exalted in their midst, they're going to be regarded, highly regarded, and they will be admired by all. When you read the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, you see in chapter 28 that God begins to give uh, blessings to the nation, and he also says, if you don't uh, do what I am commanding, there are going to be repercussions, and they're referred to as curses. But when you read Deuteronomy in 28, it says in verses 9 through 13, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they will fear you. When it says they will fear you, they will be in awe of you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. And so that's what the Lord promised the nation of Israel. And that's the picture that you have here as God is beginning to move amongst them. They shall be in the midst of many people like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, to tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a, a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. He says in verse 9, Your hand shall be lifted against your adversaries. All your enemies shall be cut off. No nation, no enemy will prevail against you, 
because God is amongst you and God is restoring and protecting you. And then we get to something very interesting in verse 10. It shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land, throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorceries from your hand. You shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images, I will also cut off. Your sacred pillars from your midst, you shall have no more work. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus, I will destroy your cities. I will execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. I want to spend some time looking at this. As, this is going to be a shorter study than you used to. And some of you say, oh, my prayers have been answered. Amen, amen, amen. In verses 10 and 11, that says basically that God will remove the things that Israel has leaned on for support. They're not going to rely on military might. They're not going to be relying on fortified cities for protection. They are going to learn that God has always been their protector. And they are going to, in that day, learn to completely trust in him. The Bible in Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Psalm 68, verse 20, our God is a God who saves from the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Okay. I've been trying to think how I can share some things with you that that might help us in this season that we're in, in our nation. I was asked last night a question related to this upcoming election. My immediate response, and it was in a kind of a, silly way, please understand it in that light. I said, well, we have over 300 million Americans, and it's hard to believe that the two running for president are the best that we have to offer. <laughs> I don't want to speak improperly of those who are running for the office of president. I certainly don't want to come off as somebody who um, is flippant, and I also want to be very careful to say that, um, that Jesus died for both candidates. He died for Hillary, and he died for Donald. And while I reserve the right to prefer one as a candidate over the other, I don't want to denigrate the humanity or value of either one of those people. So it becomes very difficult to, to make decisions if all you have to go on is whether you like or don't like somebody in a personal way. And what I've seen, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a little bit because there is a point to this. You'll, you'll say after I've made the point, you'll say that was no point, but there is a point. <laughs> on the one hand, we live in a democracy where we're given the opportunity to make choices based on our, our value system, our morals, and the things that pertain to how we view life. I, as a Christian, over 43 years of reading and studying the Bible and teaching it, I've actually been reading the Bible longer than 43 years, but teaching the Bible, learning the Bible, I haven't learned it yet, learning the Bible, 43 years, is a pretty good investment of my life. And thus, because I've read things in scripture, it's helped to formulate how I approach life in general. In general, it has informed me about raising kids. It has informed me concerning my marriage. 
It's informed me concerning obligations to the nation. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, unto God the things that belong to God. It was that scripture that Jesus quoted that gave to me the ability to make a decision to serve in the U.S. military. So I did my time based on the fact that I have obligations to, to the political system, Caesar, and my obligation to God. And so I believed at the age of 20 that going into the military was a proper thing to do, while others may disagree. I believed that that was my responsibility, and thus I served. I served with the attitude that, that there are justifiable orders, I, I, I need to learn to follow them, etc., 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 and that's how I went into the military, and that's, part of, that's, a, that's a huge part of the reason why I did my time. And so, over the years, what has happened to me is I have been reading the Bible, and I have seen things that God says he will bless, and I have seen things that God says he will not bless. So when it comes to making decisions concerning the casting of a vote, on the one hand, I know that God raises up one and puts down the other. I know that God places people into position, and thus, because he is sovereign and does so, I'm aware of that. I also know that he has given to me responsibility to exercise my free determination to make choices. And very often the choices that I make are really reflecting the things that I believe most sincerely. And so that's how I go about voting. We live in a democracy. I have one vote. I have an opportunity to exercise it. And thus I do. I have already voted. I already sent in our ballot. I already made my choice as to what I believe is right. And, uh, and, and I voted my conscience, which I encourage all to do. With that said, I look at what the people stand for. And I try and get away from the mudslinging and the silliness of two juveniles playing and fighting on a junior high campus. Because that's what I think I was watching. Forgive me if this is seeming too political, but that's what Marie and I, my wife and I, began to say, this reminds me of two 12-year-olds throwing mud at each other. That's what it reminded me of. Where, where are the issues? Where are the substantive things that we need to be hearing about? What are you really planning to do? What is your record, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So I, I try to take two or three steps back to hear what they're saying. And then what I do is I look at the track record. And as I look at the track record, I begin to say, there seems to be a pattern here over these years. And that's what I did, and that's what I was doing here. Was, was uh, Donald Trump, for example, would that be m my first choice? No. No. Would Hillary Clinton be my first choice? No. <laughs> See, you can say that. I can't. I have to be <laughs> sober-minded. So what has led to some of the decisions I've made? Some, some are asking. That's the reason I'm even bringing this up. One of the things that has moved me and my wife the most is the Supreme Court nominations. Because as the courts go, go the morals of this nation. And so... I know where one candidate says they're going to go. They've already made it clear. And I know where the other candidate says they're going to go. They have made it clear. I'm looking at the future for my children and grandchildren, especially my grandchildren. Because any Supreme Court justice that's appointed can live 30 or 40 years, a whole generation. That can affect the entire moral fabric of this nation for the entire lifetime or almost the lifetime of my grandchildren, a good portion of it. So I've been looking at that. And I want people who are in favor of life. I want people who, who line up with the values that I see as scripture. And that's how I voted. I didn't, I didn't vote based on personality. I certainly couldn't do that. I couldn't. 
I, I, I wade through issues of honesty. And I, I, can sh I can show you, I'm not wanting to go there, but I can show you things that were said over the last many years, even this last week, that were fabrications. I, I can speak to you about saying things about a man, and he said certain things 11 years ago, and how bad that man is, which I heard, you all heard it if you follow the news at all. And as I hear this outrage on behalf of women, I wonder, but wait a minute, I'm old enough to remember when your husband was doing a whole lot of things to women and you, see, and that's how I think. I, I haven't taken my brain and put it on the side. It's still here. And I still know, wait a minute, I'm old, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old. And so I, I see patterns. Even a child is known by his deeds, whether he be good or evil. And so I've seen these patterns. And that's how I went about voting. I went, on, I went about voting based on the fact that I am not voting for the pastor of the United States. I'm voting for the president of the United States. And to be honest with you, and you all know who I voted for, I'm not even telling you. I like Mike Pence, evangelical believer in Jesus Christ. I do trust him. And that's the direction. Now, why did I bring that up to you? Because in the end, there is a point. I told you there's a point. Here we come to it. I do my part because I have responsibilities, but I don't trust in horses and I don't trust in chariots. I trust in God. That's how it works. So I trust in the Lord. And so, see, okay, I'll take you step two. <laughs> do you mind if I share with my, you my heart today? I, 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 don't, I don't want to be offensive to you, but I'm wanting to share some things. that, are, that, that, that uh, You know, some of you can disagree, and that's fine. You're wrong. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> See, I got this ancient history. I got saved in what was called a revival. I'm not speaking about going to a small church in some small neighbor. I'm talking about a, a revival where God poured his spirit out and multitudes of youth. I was a youth, 20 years of age, got saved. I came out of a background that is not dissimilar to young people today. We had concern about climate change, except they were saying that it was going to freeze. It wasn't getting hot. We got concerned about riots in the streets and civil rights. Black Panthers, Brown Berets, various radical groups rose up. That was part of the national dialogue, dialogue the riots that took place, as I've mentioned recently in Newark, in Detroit, in Chicago, in Watts. I grew up through that. I saw the, on television, the reports of the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, of, of Martin Luther King Jr., of, 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 of Bobby Kennedy. I saw those, I lived through those. My wife and I just today were remembering John John, they used to call him John John, John Kennedy's son, John John, as he was saluting when his father's body was brought past him. And I, as a 13-year-old young man, cried as a 13-year-old at the emotion that I felt in knowing that my president was killed. So we went through crazy times. We went through invasions, not just of, not just of radical, um, militant, I hate Vietnam sentiments. We're always at war. You hear that now too? We heard it then. I have gone through those things, through the drugs that were introduced, the tune in and turn on and drop out of Timothy Leary and others. I lived through that. I was one of the few people 
in my era because it wasn't rampant. There were no laws saying we should be able to smoke. I voted against the marijuana thing, by the way. <laughs> Duh. But there were, there, you know, in, in the school I went to, Sierra High School, we were recognized in the Whittier Union School District in 1968. The president, Bob Vieira, got up and spoke to us in assembly, 2,000 students. And he said, Sierra High School has just been recognized as the number one drug-infected school in Whittier Union School District. My friends and I started cheering, yeah, woo! I was a pothead at 17. I was dropping acid at 17. See, so I was already a drunk at, at, at 16. See, I was already in that scene. That was me. That's what I did. That's how I thought. That's what I believed. So when I speak to you, I'm speaking as a person who got saved, radically saved from an environment that was crazy. It was crazy, and you go to a church, and, and they're singing songs about Jesus, and, and, and dopers like me are getting saved, and then going out and planting churches. Calvary Chapel has 1,600 churches, and many of them planted by men just like me, who were so lost, were found, and now talk about Jesus. See, that's, that's how it works. Understand me, that's how it works. And so the, the, the tears you see come in my, my I, like even now, is gratitude. God saved me. I'm so grateful for what he's done. I tear up. I tear up. I've never stopped being grateful to the work that God does. But as I watched this in the 70s, the movement began to grow, and young people were writing songs. Churches are being birthed. And, and then the church started thinking that we were the moral majority. And a great man, Jerry Falwell, began to produce political kinds of situations for Christians to get involved in so we could take over this country and we could elect righteous individuals. And the spirit was lifted because we started thinking that government was going to be the savior of the people. That's why you don't hear me preach about politics. It isn't because I don't have political views. I do. And it isn't because I'm, I'm ignorant of issues. I'm not. It's because the only thing that will change a human heart is not a law, but it is grace. And that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why I preach the way I do. Not everybody likes that. Why don't you instruct the church about these issues? Because if I teach you to love Jesus and you read your newspaper and you watch the news, I bet you can make decisions for yourself. Bet you can. You don't need me standing up here and saying, I vote for this and I vote for that. I don't think you do, do you? I don't think you do. I know this. I know that the movement that I am a part of started losing its momentum when we started thinking that we should be involved as a movement in electing righteous leaders. As far as I know, there's only one righteous leader, that's King Jesus, and the rest of us are sinners in need of God's grace. Now, I don't want to quench the spirit of what God wants to do, and that's why I present to you the studies that I do. Churches today, are pastored by pastors who become performers. Worship teams have become entertainment. Congregations have become audiences. And sanctuaries have become theaters. And the spirit is outside the door because the pastor and his entertainment team has created an environment where people can feel good about themselves and know nothing about Jesus. That's a fact. That's a fact. I listen to some of the more popular teachers, not with a 
heart to hate, but with a heart to listen. And I can name teachers that people think are very popular who I can tell you aren't teaching the Word of God. They're teaching their own experiences, their own humorous stories, their own victories. But where's Jesus in the midst? And guess what? The church doesn't care. You know why? Because the church wants entertainment rather than exhortation. Because they want to be happy and they don't care about being holy. Because they can go out and do whatever they want on a Saturday and serve in the Sunday school on Sunday. And they don't realize that because they're not being fed the word of God and their eyes aren't being pointed to Jesus Christ, that they're really losing out on the blessings that God wants to bring into their life. And thus, I know that I am viewed by some as just that, that old man up there who, and whatever. I don't care. What I do care about is you knowing the truth that sets you free. And that's why we go through the Bible. That's why. And by the way, that's the scripture saying, listen, he's saying in that day, and I'll close now. <laughs> it shall be in that day, says the Lord, I will cut off your horses from your midst, destroy your chariots. I'll cut off the cities of your land, throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorceries from your hand, Shall have no, you shall have no soothsayers, carved images. I will also cut off your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. I am going to cleanse you from all idolatry. I am going to keep you from the things that have harmed you. And your Messiah is the one you will look to because you have been cleansed of your occultism. You've been cleansed of your idolatry. All false re religion will be done away with. And you will finally worship God in spirit and in truth. And he finally says at the end, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. Interestingly, it says, I will deal with the nations that have harmed my people Messiah will bring peace during the tribulation. I will bring vengeance and, ang and anger on those who attacked Israel. Their rejection will result in their judgment. When it says, on the nations that have not heard, here's your last thought. The word heard there is not a word that means um, just hearing words. When he says, who have not heard, it is also translated, who have not obeyed. It is not enough to say, I have heard. I am blessed because I hear and obey. And my obedience, this is important, my obedience demonstrates that I actually have heard. And that's why the Lord would say, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. It's not just, oh yeah, I heard a Bible study once. It's to hear and obey. Be doers of the word, James says, and not forgetful hearers, deceiving yourselves. You can think, he was saying, that because you heard a Bible study, that you know what it was. If you know these things, Jesus said, blessed are you if you what? If you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. It's not just me hearing and being able to repeat my favorite passages from somebody's cassette or video or DVD or you name it, up and down the line of various means of communication today. It's that I've heard and I've done. And that's, if you want to know the Bible, make up your mind to do what it says. Jesus said, if you obey me, my father and I will make our home in you. He said, we will manifest ourselves to you. John 14, 21 and 23. Look it up. If you obey me, we will abide with you, and I will manifest myself to you. Do you want to know me, Jesus said? You want to know me? Obey me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And John says, and his commandments are not grievous. They are not burdensome. Why? Because the truth sets you free. 
And so it isn't a burden for me to say, oh, man, I want to get drunk before I preach next Sunday. I want to smoke some. You know, it makes me see God more. If you love me, keep my word.